Hey there, creatures great and small. Nowadays, in progressive and scholarly circles, it's considered almost obvious that we should tax the rich. It comes out of every supposedly realistic discussion among liberals. How will we fund our chosen policy? We'll tax rich people. In this video, I'm going to first explain why taxing the rich will not solve any problems, and second, provide an alternative model to taxing the rich you can begin to implement today. I'm Chris, and this is what had to be said. In most political discourse nowadays, you'll find there isn't much talk of goals. That's a big weakness of political discourse. We always talk about which person or party to vote for, and never talk about which social goals that vote and that election and that candidate are supposed to be working towards. If we never talk about goals, we don't spend the time considering whether our actions actually work toward those goals. Our assumptions of what everyone else's goals are are buried way down below the public discourse. So instead of saying how one or another of these goals might be achieved through a given means, like voting for a given presidential candidate, we just hear how that candidate has performed recently. We assume that means steps towards or away from our goals, when it may well have no effect on them. The same is true about taxing the rich. It seems to be part of what it means to be a progressive today, to want the state to have more money and the rich to have less. But what's the goal exactly? If it's taking power away from the super-rich and decentralizing it, in other words, taking power from the powerful and giving it to the vulnerable, I can get on board. If your goal is to feed and house the poor or give everyone health care, I'm down. But maybe the reason we don't hear about goals in this context is taxing the rich is not a means to those ends. Folks who want to tax the rich are laboring under the same fantasy as most people in a democracy, that they have some say in how that money would be spent. They dream of having access to the trillions, yes, it's trillions, of dollars stashed away in offshore bank accounts and investing it in high-speed rail, cheap carbon-neutral housing, and free health care. But that's not how taxes work. You don't get to decide what happens with that money. You have zero say in how it's spent. Why would more than a tiny percentage of that money go to anything you want? Shit, we're talking about governments with trillion dollar budgets. They could already have made health care, roads, and anything else free if they'd wanted to. If their job really was to listen to the people and do things for them. But then, where would they get the trillions of dollars they spend on war? Not to mention all the all other horrible things that the state does, like locking millions of people up or just pepper spraying them for protesting. I see no reason to believe an influx of cash would change any of that. In light of the many awful things the state does and will always do until we tear it down, I don't want the state to have any more money. I get that it's a problem that many of the biggest corporations pay their workers poorly and hardly pay any taxes, but those two problems are not really related. They can get away with anything because they're big corporations. And states everywhere protect and subsidize big corporations. They're not at odds. If you want things like infrastructure and healthcare, stop looking to the capitalist state to provide it. Considering how much government, insurance companies, and pharmaceutical companies, and so on, raise the price of healthcare, often through the roof, for a lot of people, they're not 
providing those things. They're forcibly restricting them. Only through widespread mutual aid are people going to have access to health care in the U.S. Besides, the state always finds a way to give whatever it, money it collects back to the rich, whether through tax breaks, foundations, trusts, uh, contracts, maybe no-bid contracts, or subsidies. The system ensures that whatever legal means you want to use, the power structure will not change. The point is, if you really want to control that money, cut out the middleman. Same with if you believe in justice. You'll never get justice from an institution that exists to shield the rich and powerful from accountability. How can we even talk about justice within such a system? If the state doesn't provide justice, it's up to us to create it. Okay, so let's totally change the subject here, okay? I've been thinking about writing a book where people all over the world rise up to take back everything the rich have taken from them. Purely fictional and for entertainment purposes only, of course. Just like this video. People began to discuss their situation, develop alternative media and discussion groups. They came to see the ruling elite were the main cause of their problems. They realized they'd been deceived and robbed. They knew the state was the servant of the elite and was not a vehicle for change. They recognized the law as the barrier to freedom and justice it is in our world, and they lost their fear of breaking it. So in small independent groups, they began to take back power. First, they started going on strike. At first, the strikes didn't get much attention, but then people began to realize the goal of the strikes was the complete takeover of the businesses they worked for. Factory and office workers carried out sit-ins and workplace occupations and sabotage. And when enough people joined them, uh, they would take over whole buildings and run them as their own. Their supporters would bring them food and things. So they stopped charging money for what they were producing and just gave it out for free. Same with the supermarkets. At first, customers just took things from the store and, you know, put them in the donation bins or encouraged people to shoplift. But the security cameras saw everything and the bosses made the workers put it all back. So customers and employees alike decided to occupy the stores and give everything away for free. They soon convinced the farmers and the delivery people to join them, so supermarkets and grocery stores became the place where anyone could get food, not just people with money. It wasn't easy for producers to meet demand accurately without the feedback of prices, but they soon devised various ways of estimating how much it would take to supply everyone with what they needed. A lot of the resources they saved on marketing, advertising, and whatever other wasteful competitive activities, they put into automating the hardest and most dangerous jobs. When it became clear that they weren't just striking, but taking over businesses from the owners and giving away things for free, the police came. <clears throat> but the people knew you could tie down the police in other ways. So whenever they could... They also engaged in taunting the police, graffiti, setting fire to unattended cop cars, or just siphoning their gas or blowing their tires, blocking roads, and even robbing banks. One anonymous group of five friends claimed they robbed a different bank every week during the revolt. Another said it had stolen cars from every rich person in town. Nobody believed them at first until they started giving the cars away on the street. People confined to their homes would call the police every day with false leads, like flooding them with calls about a non-existent riot in one part of town, while others were preparing to burn down the parliament building in another. 
And even people who weren't fully committed to revolution were at least smashing speed cameras and surveillance devices everywhere they saw them. The police were helpless. The rich, of course, wrapped, ramped up their propaganda, using their money, their newspapers, and so on to divide people by race or class or gender, but the people saw it coming and continued to practice solidarity. They had to fight off right-wing death squads as well as police, and they were successful because they had greater numbers. In this society that I dreamed about, or am writing about, or whatever, everyone knew they were under surveillance, so they had to organize quietly. They knew the police would try to infiltrate even the most harmless movements, so they learned about security culture and keeping their mouths shut. Some of them still got arrested and even killed, but they understood the reality of Malcolm X's lesson, the price of freedom is death. These were strong believers in justice, so they thought punishments would ideally be proportionate, minimally violent, and fit the crime. One very popular idea during the uprising of this imaginary society was finding out who were the shareholders and uh, operators of the big weapons manufacturers, finding out where they lived, kicking them out of their homes, and inviting refugees to live there. This way, they would only target people profiting off destroying people's lives. Likewise, they tracked down landlords who had evicted people for not having enough money, kicked them out of their homes, and let poor people live there. This kind of measure eliminated the norm of property, so people no longer had to pay just to live somewhere. They lived wherever they wanted. And of course, the refugees and homeless people were part of the planning and execution of these things, because the people knew the biggest victims of capitalism should be the ones most empowered to bring it down. Everyone participates in a revolution. Soon hackers began to get on board with this taxing of the rich, and it seemed like every day some millionaire said their bank account had been hacked. Some bank accounts were impossible to hack, so people just ended up burning down the buildings of the banks, after evacuating all the people, of course. People were angry these rich folks had gotten away with their crimes so long. They went to their country clubs and golf courses, and at first they were going to occupy those buildings too, but they decided it would be better symbolically to smash and burn them too. Over time, all the land of the old golf courses became forest again. In this, this uh, very, very unfair society, this place uh, a long time ago, in a very faraway country. They had concentration camps for people who had done little more than just crossing a border. In the midst of this uprising, a huge march on the camps was organized. Thousands of people took part in the dismantling of the camps and the destruction of the offices and vehicles used to administer this vile government program. At first, the people tearing down the concentration camps thought they would only be freeing those prisoners. But as they became more aware, realizing how the system has always worked, they came to see all prisoners as political prisoners. They soon started marching on jails as well. The people who had been imprisoned for things like murder and rape, well, they eventually transferred them to other facilities, which were more humane but still prevented them from leaving. Everyone else, they went free. The people had finally ended the rule of the rich. They lived free and happy, and they had fun doing it. It was quite the dream or story or period of history. Oh, so 
I was talking about taxing the rich, right? <laughs> right. All I'm saying about that is using the state to tax the rich is a dead end. There's plenty more we could do. But, of course, I would never condone anything illegal.